Clemmer. Yeah. Uh, Richard Parsaliti. Present. Angie Gregory. Here. Katie Deppin. I'm here. Eric Winkler. Present. All right. Uh, so we have a we, we, we have called the to, to order. Now what? Now do I do public comment? <laughs> yeah. Now it. All right. Sure. <laughs> Is there any public comment? Adele, did you have anything to share? You often do. No, I don't. Thank you. Wow. Very All right. So the first thing I have to say is, is obviously I am sorry about the screw up that has us meeting on the, but you know, out of cycle, uh, which is probably why uh, Carolyn can't make it because the TPC is happening at the same time. Um, also have to apologize, Eric, uh, put on the agenda or got us to put on the agenda a discussion about interconnection and uh, you know residential solar and uh, the challenge of um, dealing with transmission infrastructure uh, to you know at, as a barrier and the folks from National Grid who were going to come and basically do a presentation and a Q and A had to back out so that is not on the agenda this time but they have said they want to come December 10th. So I don't know if we have to do anything other than acknowledge that. <laughs> Eric, did, did, you did they say they couldn't, they didn't want to come because the rescheduling or their? Uh, no, they had, uh, he, he didn't specify what the emergency was. He it, he had been in, on board about the rescheduling. Um, it's just that, so he was going to have, I forget what an SMC even stands for, but he had an SMC who was going to come, but who now couldn't come because of some emergency. And, I, I know Bob from uh, the ISO, so good, yeah. good person. I just, just so folks understand what, I, why I raise the issue is that it's not transmission, it's distribution. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's issues apparently in various locations in our fair city where ad adding additional residential solar um, is is um, a problematic for the distribution system to handle the directional of flow. So I was curious um, and, and, and asked Ben to, you know, see if we could get some clarity on uh, where there are issues so that folks understand um, um, that they may not be able to install a solar system uh, without um, um, some issues. And some of those issues can be uh, you have to pay for upgrades. And my, um, my limited knowledge in this area is that, uh, well, <laughs> Uh, I, I have some knowledge, but my limited understanding is that the distribution companies uh, I thought were on the hook for paying for distribution upgrades for residential um, as opposed to uh, um, utility scale where you're actually um, uh, required to follow the open access transmission tariff, which is a whole different a whole different ball game. But I know in my own personal experience, my interconnection for our system yep. took like six months longer than normal. Yeah. Um, and I've heard through the grapevine that some people are are having even more significant issues with that. So I, I think this is a good form to understand that so the public knows knows where we're at. I mean, my understanding has always been that um, you know, if you needed a, a, a transformer upgraded at the end of a particular street or something, basically someone had to go first and pay for the whole transformer upgrade. And that was the problem. It, as it turns out, Gavi, before she worked here, worked for Eversource uh, with some of these connections. So I don't know if you have any insight on that in terms of the rules, Gavi. Uh you're right, Ben. I mean, the, the customer is responsible for paying for the transformer. Um, 
and it can take months. There's maybe for residential, it's not as bad, but their Eversource at least was really backed up with transformers. Um, so yeah, it's not ideal if you need a transformer. It, it, yeah, the uh, the ISO um, probably about a half a decade ago um, recognized that um, all of the very relatively small utility scale solar installations we're going to start coming up against issues related to transmission, in particular southeastern Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, the ISO with um, authorization by FERC developed a, a, a sort of a, a, a separate process for interconnection that involved group studies. And so that's something, you know, if the distribution companies are finding that, you know, the last few customers or the, the, the one customer that's next in line has to pay $60,000 for a transformer. Exactly. Well, then maybe you should just kind of hold off and do a group <laughs> study and then figure out how you can share that cost across a broader set of participants. It's, it's an unfortunate conundrum here. Um, my neighbors all have like, 15 to 20 kilowatt systems, which is far more than they need. Yeah. And many of them are leased spaces. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to install a 10 kilowatt system because that's a reasonable size system for my household load on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. But I can't. <laughs> they limited me to five kilowatts yeah. because the system couldn't handle the additional five five kilowatts of, of load on system. So this is not uncommon. And right. it's, it's problematic to moving this process forward, especially when, you know, someone's looking to spend $15,000 and then all of a sudden they have a $75,000 bill. It's not, it's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. So this is actually something Gabby and I have been, well, talking about, but we haven't really made any progress uh partly because the utility maps are not as good as we thought they would be which is obviously this is a collective action problem right if you could get everybody on a you know on a certain transformer that needed to be upgraded to like all go solar all together get a really really good deal because they're buying bulk and you know like you know all that sort of stuff you could actually then pay for that transformer by adding a little bit to everybody's overall cost but then they bring the cost down it might you know like the concept at least is worth looking at and we had a lot of trouble using the utility map anyway <clears throat> to find where would those locations be um but that is a concept we're at least interested in <laughs> yeah the, the other concept in transmission planning is that if a system upgrade improves reliability so not just because that facility wants to interconnect, but in that process and those upgrades which are required actually improve the reliability of the system, then the transmission owner is allowed to pass those costs off to everyone. It becomes socialized across the entire system. So I don't know, you know, if if someone down the street puts in a, you know, pays to pay, improve a transformer, well, then the next person gets a free pass in. And that seems kind of... You know, I mean, it's just right. it's, it's, unfair. it's not yeah. it's, it's not a great situation to be the last person in and then have to spend 10 times what your what your budget is because you have to pay for a system upgrade. So right. this is, you know, I've been just waiting for this to happen um, as I've, I've seen it on the larger scale. But distribution is not designed to handle these kinds of reverse flows. Right. And honestly, distribution companies should pay for this. They should bake it into the into T and D costs, and all energy users should absorb the, that. This is my opinion. That it should be. So, it so should I would be say so once on on December tenth, when when Bob Ide and whoever his SMC is again acronym I don't know uh, are with him. Uh, these are the the things to bring up with them and see what we can do. Yeah. Um, so that was just that was really just getting getting through the announcement of that particular um, uh, uh, topic is 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 been moved off to to the twelfth. We should uh, 
review and approve the minutes, which Gabi sent around, I guess, last week. Um, does anyone want me to share my screen on the minutes? Um, or have, are we re ready to? Well, yeah. let's, let's do a motion to approve the minutes and then have discussion. Okay, fair I'm, enough. I move to approve the minutes. Second. Uh, is there any discussion? Thank you. Thank you, Gabby, for the minutes. They were very concise. Um, oh, that's right. I was going to try uh, to use the the AI to record uh, re record minutes for us and see if we can get some help. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I just turned that on and we'll, we'll see what it, what it looks like. <laughs> um, but maybe we can spare Gabi some of that, that labor, or at least make it easier. Um, okay. So hearing no discussion other than complimenting Gabi, do we want to take a vote on it? Uh, we'll approve the minutes. Anyone second? Second. Okay. Uh, I will call the roll. Eric Winkler. Approve. Louis Hasbrook. Approved. Deb Clemmer. Yes. Uh, Carolyn Mish. Yeah. Rich Persliti. Yes. Angie Gregory. Approved. Uh, Marissa Elkins. Yes. Katie Deppin. Uh, I kind of saw her lips move. I count. <laughs> Sorry. <there> you, yes. <laughs> um, and me also approve. Okay, good. We've done that. Um, uh, let's see, where were we? I think the next item is pollinator subcommittee from Angie Gregory. So take it away, Angie. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. So I think when we, um, one of the last times we, we met, we talked about this, um, and Carolyn had a suggestion to connect with maybe the environmental club at, um, the high school to kind of identify a project because there had been some outreach before from them. Um, so really the update is just that um, I've been connecting with the student group um, to find a time when we could meet. And I was hoping that maybe for this little update, I could share a little bit about what I know so far that they want to chat about. Um, Rich and I are actually going to meet them in person on Thursday morning um, so we could discuss kind of what is feasible, um, what kind of resources would be involved, you know, all those kind of particulars. And so I'm kind of hoping in this conversation, maybe um, the committee or commission could um, support and just like what would be the information we would want to be gathering from um, the environmental club um, and other considerations and around just feasibility of doing um, a project and to just share what the environmental club had shared with me um, about what they see at um, the high school in terms of grounds and resiliency and um, desire for, you know, pollination um, habitats. Um, they basically, I think, were, were uh, directing their focus on the hill at Northampton High. And I'm, I'm still kind of looking for clarification, but I'm guessing that's the hill that like slopes down to the back of the athletic fields. Um, but they talk about mowing there and I don't think that gets mowed, but maybe it does. Um, I think they're just kind of n wanting some kind of assistance on how to properly rewild that landscape um, or change it in some ways. Um, so I think the group leaders are really interested in just discussing um, what the potential pathways are for moving forward. Um, and then what kind of support either the commission and or um, grounds at the high school um, could provide to um, support something like this. They really want to see the grounds like expressing um, a beneficial ecosystem and kind of showing that cue of care um, to the community that um, there's a sustainable endeavor happening. So um, I was thinking that we'd probably just try to get a sense of what current support the environmental club has in terms of, you know, um, who their mentors and um, uh, just like staff um, are within the school that can support them and how um, to kind of maintain a project that might continue past when some of these seniors graduate because um, 
a couple of the students who are leading this are, are seniors. So, um, and then just general discussion around fund use and um, how, how that could get implemented. So, so that's the, the general update. And um, I'm interested just to hear anything that people are wanting to share in reflection to that. I feel like you had some specific questions that it might be that Rich can answer, um, uh, which was like essentially what's getting mowed and who's doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, is that true, Rich, that you're the one who would answer that? I, 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 I don't want to admit to that. No, no, <laughs> hold on a second. Let me, uh, uh, yeah. So basically, you know, the school department is the school department, the high school in particular is all maintained by the school grounds crew with the exception of the large areas behind the school, like the flat playing fields, the DPW mows them. And that's typical of all the school properties. And then the other facilities uh, where park and recreation with DPW overlap uh, in their programming um, and maintenance, we, the DPW maintains them. So that accounts for like, for example, like Florence Fields, um, Sheldon Field, Arcanum Field, Mainsfield, et cetera. I could rattle off a long list. I don't want to bore you all, but there's, yeah. And then, you know, this DPW also maintains uh, all the pocket parks uh, like Trinity Row, um, the, uh, um, War Memorial Park in Leeds, those kind of parks that are not, that don't have active recreation. They're more passive. Right. Or, or just, uh, yeah, just passive. So, I mean, but there's a lot of places where I think we mow when we, this is not new. We, we mow that we, we just mow for the sake of mowing because we're already there mowing something else. And we might as well just mow it because it's easier to mow it than it is to do anything else with it. Just and a lot of it has to do with capacity. So, I think it's definitely a good thing that we're looking at this and I'm hoping that we can take some of those areas that have no real functionality um, that we, we just mow because we're there that we can actually turn them into pollinator areas or even places maybe where we could plant trees as well. I'm always, I'm always looking for new places to plant trees. But, you know, that's, that's another, another topic, but yeah. Um, at which is worth, Thinking about, so Angie, like where, where they were talking about that hill. So it sounds like, tell me if I'm wrong, Angie, that this group is really interested in working on something adjacent to the high school. Like they want, yes. it's, it's about proximity to their, the center of their yeah. world, Yeah, um, which is great. Um, you know, I think the first thing, you know, Rich is saying, well, I'm looking for places to plant trees. I mean, that's that's one one thing you can do on a hillside uh have have they considered that as a treatment for for that location i i, I don't know um maybe they have but you make a good point i think that would be really helpful too probably for erosion control um i'm guessing because it is kind of a steep slope if that's the if that's the hill they're talking about um i'm not familiar with any other hill on, at the high school that's that's I the mean, hill I think it's pretty steep. Obviously, Rich, you can determine whether it makes sense to put, I mean, there are trees around the edges where it's not so steep, but that hillside has traditionally been mowed. I think this is the first year that it wasn't mowed. Um, and I don't know what the reason, I was hoping Rich had an answer to that, but it, apparently it's the school um, grounds people that um, decided maybe they didn't have capacity, so they just didn't mow it um, this year. Um, but and I think that, that? what's that? Is, is there, no, I'm that? saying that might yeah. be a good example of a place, you know, it's very visible. The students can see it, feel it, touch it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, so can the community. Um, and so maybe, and since it is steep and certainly in some sections, I, um, I think it, um, might be harder to um, grow trees on the deepest part of that slope. So maybe that is a great place for um, to do a demonstration project that could turn permanent, especially given there may be an interest in no longer mowing it. <laughs> um, but, I think and there's would, a lot of sun. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also note just this year, something that I noticed as um, a parent of an athlete and, and going to, um, two games. And, um, typically, I mean, others probably 
recognize this too, if they've ever gone to a, a high school game, um, sometimes people like to sit on that hillside to spectate as opposed to going to the stands. Um, though this year they kind of, um, the athletic uh, booster club or, or whoever is, you know, collecting um, admission for watching games um, started to also put up a table over there to dissuade people from going over there for cheap seats. Um, and so I, I think there might also be uh, likely a desire to try to um, congregate spectators to the stadium as opposed to the hillside. And, and that's likely just to capture revenue to support the athletic program. Um, I think there are also people who are choosing to use that hillside for accessibility reasons. I saw a lot of older people, people in chairs, um, folding chairs with backs, um, utilizing that space. So I think maybe also having a conversation with um, the athletic director could be useful if thinking about some sort of redo for the hillside and how maybe there's still a way to create some space where people who maybe need it for accessibility reasons could could also be over there or maybe it's it's the desire to perfectly dissuade people from um spectating on that side i mean i feel like this is a school's uh jurisdiction thing where you, you you'd want to know what they want i don't know katie do you, i know you're you're next door to that anyway um do you have any insight on on how they're using that hill or what what they would want uh, not necessarily. Uh, I can touch base with Tony in regards to the management of that hillside. Um, you know, I know some of the other properties on um, the school campus, um, like JFK, there's a certain hillside that they, excuse me, they don't mow um, normally, or you do like a two to three mow a season um, mm -hmm. just to keep, um, you know, certain vegetation down. Um but for that hillside, I, I'll check with, I can check in with Tony and see um, if there kind of is, is any plans and or um, what their maintenance schedule is. I mean, it's, it seems like this high school group, if they wanted to put some effort in, could try and actually do a little bit of landscape architecture, you know, where they're actually trying to say, well, here's where people are want to use the hillside and we can kind of guide them to that, maybe have a path. I don't know, wood chips, I, I don't know the answer, but, you know, like some sort of like deliberate signal to people about how to use a certain section and then set aside another area, you know, and actually just do it deliberately, learn some basic kind of landscape architecture ideas from somebody. <laughs> uh, I wish it was UMass. That would be really awesome. Like to have like, you know, LARP take, take that on. I, I really don't know what exposure or knowledge they would have to that. Um, but, but that's definitely something I can, you know, I can inquire with them about if there are maybe, I don't know if somebody's taking an environmental studies class or if there's any, um, any teacher within the school that they know that that would want to mentor in that way. I think that could be, that could be really awesome. I do know I'm going to have, I, I know her first name is Susan and I have blanked on her actual uh, full name. Susan Sullivan uh, is a teacher at the high school who used to be like the sponsor for the environmental club or something. And she's got $5,000 that she needs to spend. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I would say if they've got something that might cost some money, uh, you know, especially if it's investing in, in something that's going to actually stay there. Uh, that seems like a good use for it. And she might also be a good resource for them. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's the other kind of question is what what other um, capacity? I think as Rich was, was uh, implying the reason that mowing is happening is because they're already out mowing. It's easier. It's low maintenance, right? And, um, you know there's there's going to be continual maintenance or weeding or other kind of um other kind of things that will be involved so so who needs to be kind of involved in that conversation sounds like dpw and park and or it would just be Ooh. maybe it would be the high school yeah maintenance i think so you think i think it's be... a tony question yeah yeah, yeah. typically when we've we've engaged um this uh, central services in the school department 
uh, at different school locations to do multiple tree plantings over the last three years. So it's really been a concerted effort between those entities, DPW, Urban Forestry Commission, and of course the principal um, at the school. And then we also had a volunteer, um, uh, Chris Chamberlain from Berkshire Design. Mm. Um, so it's been like a PTO parent movement, which accumulates in a planting day, uh, like on a weekend where we have a bunch of volunteers from the school. So, you know, this has similar um, hallmarks, I think, yeah. you know, so I think it's sort of, the, it's a great way to engage, uh, uh, you know, the, municip our, the municipal government, municipal entity, and also partner with um, other entities within and then just residents and other interested parties. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's definitely, like we had, we had identified quite a while ago in the previous iteration of NESC, um, a bunch of different locations for um, pollinator plantings. One of them was actually the Smith Vocational property, which is on uh, Route 9. And I, I see Tim is not here, and I haven't had a chance to connect with him, but that was plowed under and actually prepped and uh, wildflower. Right. Print, and I don't know if they actually were able to seed it or not this year. I, I think now uh, was it was about now that you would want to be doing it. And I or... or you know yeah soon, soon and it, it's also dry now sorry ben it's also dry now that's a very wet piece of soil so it's great you can get equipment on it to to sort of fluff it up um obviously i don't think we'll be harrowing up the side hill at the high school but i mean it would be using different mechanical means um probably similar to what is at the side of the city hall hill on crafts avenue so it'd be something something along that those lines just probably a lot of hand work but um but yeah tim had originally you know we, we'd done a deal at that nesc meeting where i think it was denise lello had had connection with i think the high school uh um the environmental club and that they were going to come and do the hand seeding um so i'd say angie if you're if you're the one who's kind of in contact with them um maybe kind of getting in touch with tim i don't know if, if if he, I assume he has the seed mix itself. Um, but, you know, just following up on that would be great. Sure. Yeah, I do remember that he did say he had the seed. Yeah. Okay. Is there, are we looking at a cost for the hillside at the high school? Do we know? Is that something that NESC could chip in on? Well, don't we already have a lot of extra seed more than what was needed for that uh, Smith Oak property, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess we'd probably have to figure out what the size is. I, the other thing I was thinking is there's a lot of patches of grass in between sidewalk um, grids in, on the front side of the high school that could potentially be smaller sort of plots for pollinator um, gardens, I guess, if you will. So that might be interesting to look at too, in addition to the back hillside. Um, and that maybe could be, depending on where that might be, could be coordinated with any of the tra traffic improvements that are mm -hmm. proposed for the front side of yeah. the building. When was that, when was that traffic flow improvement going to happen? soon as we get money <laughs> oh perfect um, <laughs> um yeah i mean the design i don't think is yet final but you know we'll be tracking down money this spring um uh to to um help push that project forward so in hopefully in a one two years yeah um so I don't know, I mean, the action items are fairly few, right? It's reconnect with those students, try to get them involved, the hand seating with, with Tim, uh, discussing the hillside with Tony uh, from the schools to figure out what they wanna do, um, it, you know, thinking about design with the students. And I would say, Rich, if you have time and interest, like, I mean, I wouldn't wanna dismiss trees entirely 
like I, I, you know, I, it depends on all sorts of things, but it, 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 you know, if that looks like a promising place, um, you know, tree planting is definitely an experience people enjoy and feel good about and, and trees need maintenance. Um, and, you know, so if you have a, a club that's out there doing that, it kind of gives them a sense of purpose and, Yeah, I, my impression would be is that side hill would sort of be more of an individual plant material, you know, dig a whole place, a perennial plant and just sort of have sort of a grid. I don't think, I don't, you know, putting perennial plant material, that's actually going to try to hold that hill together because once you start to disturb it and then potentially rounding it off with some tree planting. But again, that slope, that's a very steep slope. And it was modified when they built the high school. It's steeper now than it was back then. So I, I think it's just a matter of trying to look at it, figure out what kind of plant material, how much plant material, and then putting a dollar amount to it. And then, uh, you know, and working with the other stakeholders. But so considering that, you know, so it's going to have some cost, there's, there, there are, you know, so, some plant material, but this environmental club has a right to that $5,000. <laughs> and so if they've got a plan, they could probably get it. Uh, any other thoughts on this? Uh, anything else anyone wants to raise about this subject? Um, I will say uh, on December, is it 10th? Anyway, the next, next meeting, we're going to have some presentations from some uh, teams from Smith College who are working on capstone projects that are, are pra practical applications for stuff in the city. Um, and one of them is looking at uh, doing kind of a GIS mapping of potential places to do uh, pollinator or, or um, non-mowing treatments and um, and coming up with kind of a menu of, of plant assemblies that would be appropriate and cost effective. Um, so hopefully, I don't know, we'll get some more ideas from them too. That's great. Um, okay. So uh, unless uh, someone wants to talk more about this, we can do department head updates. Um, hey, Katie, do you want me to put you on the spot first? Which we haven't even acknowledged. Katie is, is uh, taking uh, um, Pat's uh, place on this meeting. Uh, and so she is functionally the department head of uh, central services for the purposes of this meeting. <laughs> um, do you, do you I, I'm totally putting you on the spot. Do you have anything interesting you'd like to share? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Ben, for the introduction. Um, yes, uh, just filling in for Pat McCarthy, our director here. Um, trying to think if we have any projects right now that are kind of outstanding that would be in relation with you guys. Um, obviously, uh, our department is working closely with Ben and Gabby um, for kind of projects coming up with um, leads and a few of our other buildings. Um, but I would say there's there's nothing outstanding that I can think of that I would assume Pat has brought you guys up to speed on. Well, it has been a while. <laughs> um, uh, Carolyn, do you happen to have any anything you want to share? Um, I guess um, only that we're you know, just share that um, sort of there's been a group of us working um, fast and furiously to meet a deadline for the EPA grant that will um, hopefully fund a bunch of stuff, including, uh, this is a climate change um, um, grant, uh, community change grant, I should say, um, that um, would potentially pay for the entire um, hub build out, including geothermal, the geothermal system. Um, we're also going to throw in the schools, um, maybe. I think this is the plan to put in uh, the HVAC system that upgrades JFK and Jackson Street because those are those eligible schools within the, um, the EPA grant framework. Um, they have to address environmental justice communities. So um, there's that piece. And then we'll also be putting in a request for bike 
bike share funding to help us transition to new bikes. Um, so anyway, um, the grant deadline is Thursday and it's um, maybe the last grant that EPA will ever give <laughs> for another four years. <laughs> Um, so anyway, fingers crossed, because that will really help us, um, you know, if we could get that geothermal for the Forbes and hub, that would be amazing. So, Yep. <laughs> uh, Rich, do you have anything uh, from DPW that you want to share? Uh, let me just make sure I'm off of mute. Hold on one second. My aunt. Uh, so let's see, we, what are we, what are we up to? We're always up to something. Um, I would have to say that probably a couple of things we are ongoing, uh, infrastructure upgrades of the wastewater treatment plant are continuing. Um, we are also winding down the construction season, uh, as most of you have probably traveled on some of the newly paved roads, uh, Chestnut street, uh, North May, uh, sorry, uh, North Elm street, uh, part of spring street. There's also been curbing improvements, ADA improvements there, and also um, uh, sidewalk improvements on those locations as well as part of those contracts. We have also the bikeway, the original portion of the bikeway that was the Francis P. Ryan section um, is received its top coat. So the bikeway is still presently closed because they're doing shoulder work and hopefully that'll be completed before snowfall. Um, so at least we can continue to plow the bikeway, but then I believe the, the vendor is going to be coming back in the spring to do, um, other ADA, um, transition work at the sidewalks, et cetera. So they'll still be doing that. Um, and then just, you know, general like DPW operations of pothole patching, which is not glamorous, but needs to be done. Uh, putting, uh, putting all the parks, um, tucking all the parks in, in the cemeteries for the winter. Um, and our regular operations at the water treatment plant and getting ready for snow plowing operations, which is always fun, which I encourage any one of you, if you're interested in plowing, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you ride, do a ride along. It'd be great. You probably would be like, I'm never doing that again. Uh, so, but yeah, so yeah, there's always something going on. Um, and on the DPW, uh, or not uh, on the wastewater treatment plant rather. Um, so I, uh, w was able to go to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, I guess it was just last week, with some engineers who are being paid by National Grid to help us come up with kind of big planning for kind of all of our facilities. Um, and we saw a lot of, first of all, a lot of really great upgrades that have already been done, like, you know, that just, just recently have been done at the wastewater treatment plant, which is great news. Um, but also kind of like just in the nick of time, we were able to uh, help them uh, select a slightly better uh, air heat, make up air unit approach that uses heat pipes to transfer heat from the exhaust air uh, to the incoming air for the dewatering building. I know everyone's fascinated. I I kind of love wastewater, so like it's a weird yeah. thing, but um, but it was it was a big opportunity to like do something that was already going to be done and kind of do it better. Um, and, uh, you know, so one thing I'm hoping is that as we do more of these, these report outs that we, um, do it, you know, that like, so if, if I had known a little bit earlier about that, I might've gotten in a little earlier and to have been less panicked <laughs> about, uh, providing a better solution. Um, but, you know, so that's one of the benefits of these, uh, things provided we actually meet, <laughs> Um, uh, Louis, do you have any, uh, anything to report? A little bit. Um, one thing is that, well, there's a new building code. So the whole building official hierarchy slash kingdom is up in arms. Um, there's no, it's, there's a lot of discussion about it. It got in front of the confusions that reigns around the energy code, which is, also in, in flux, um, the one thing that, um, and Smith College, I spent a lot of time this summer on the um, geothermal project at Smith College. So I've gotten a lot more information about it um, and, and hear more about it every day. So when it comes time for us to 
do it. Plus, um, I'll have more information, um, maybe a few hints. And then uh, they're also doing geothermal at the 727 or 737, I forget which, um, Bridge Road, the former Northampton Nursing Home Project. And uh, that's going to be um, quite a package between solar and um, geothermal um, and heat pumps. It's It'll be um, you know, a very, very, very efficient building. We'll see how that comes out. It's it's going to be interesting to see that. Um, it's uh, geothermal hasn't been without its challenges. Just know that. I mean, Smith College, I think, went a little farther than some of the other places that they looked at for models. Yep. And they're coming up against some issues, and um, there might be some discussion about a building that's newly constructed that might end up needing um, some fossil fuel backup because of the limitations of the uh, geothermal um, mm -hmm. temperature differential, how, how well it copes with it. Um, anyways, so yeah, a lot, a lot going on. Um, not a lot of answers yet, but some good guidance. To, on that subject of of fossil backup, I mean that's something that I think it's almost like a philosophical question we have to confront, which is that um, at least for the time being, with what the grid actually is, you, you only need that fossil backup when it's extremely cold, mm -hmm. um, and so you'd be drawing on a grid that's often as dirty as it's going to get, you know, on those very very cold hours mm -hmm. and a highly efficient fossil plant at least now like with the current grid the way it is um may actually be less emitting uh, less polluting than uh <laughs> than the geothermal that's drawing on a dirtier grid at that particular set of hours um, have you been at those? Have you been at these meetings? <laughs> this is exactly the discussion that's going on, because, um, yeah. and and there's also some, um, yeah, that's exactly what they're talking about, and how do they work it out, and and how far can you go um, without um, creating problems for other uh, users of the grid, also. I mean, the right. grid does right. get right to the edge of its uh, capacity on those particularly cold nights. Right. Yeah, so it's, it, it, I mean, it's fundamentally the same thing as what you would have with, say, a cogen, a uh, 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 heat and, and power generator mm -hmm. uh, that was on gas and that would actually switch to a, a say, the number two fuel oil or something because there was insufficient gas pressure in the lines. So yeah, at that scale, we need to be at least grappling with it philosophically because we have certain goals that we've imposed on ourselves that that we we actually do have to kind of do the math <laughs> to yeah. say, you know, below a certain temperature or when the grid is behaving in a certain way, are we actually better off using the backup fossil? And I mean, that's kind of how I'm designing and all these questions go to the uh, to the energy code and the requirements of the energy code. Interesting. Well, ben, one thing to figure into the calculus is that if you have an efficient fossil fuel uh, backup system, I'm assuming it's natural gas. Right. Mm -hmm. So the more natural gas you have being consumed at the distribution level or uh -huh, residential exactly. level, the less yeah. it's available at the bulk system right. level, which means right. even more of those dual fuel power plants are gonna be running off of right. yeah. oil. So it's not it's not like a one for one thing because you're, oh. you're taking away resources that would otherwise have offset the worse emitting plants. So it's a, it's a little bit of a catch-22. It is. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and, and one, know, one thing to, to keep in mind is that it's not, logic enters not into this whole equation. 
This is not a logical discussion. This is a a, tech, a very technical code um, compliance alternatives discussion. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's pretty much where I think the code is going to be more stringent in terms of requirements than than logic would be in this situation. I see. Well, that's important to know, you know, because that's what we're working with. I see Adele has a hand up. My question is, um, how does the new entry into uh, the fossil fuel free building code uh, factor into this? That's the question. Yep. That is the question. And, and the answer is still not 100% clear. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, it's it it is interesting. I, I mean, again, this that there's not no time for for all of this now, but I would really love to know kind of some of the details of where or where things are interpretation discussions that we can impact, um, where maybe logic should have a role, <laughs> and and we can try to try to communicate on that stuff. Um, has, I don't know if anybody here has insight into like, if like battery storage is even feasible for at scale for, for backup or like a alternate peaker plant type thing for a larger system that we're talking about. It's sort of resistive heating that can run off a of DC or AC. It, it could be. Batteries don't really provide a whole lot of thermal, efficient thermal, right? You have to convert that into something electric. Yeah. Oh, I guess that, yeah, I was just, I was just saying in terms of like, if this is for backup generation, right? For say there was an electrical outage and, and the, um, the electrical mechanics of the geothermal system to move the heat pumps isn't able to function. Yeah, I think it's a different a possibility problem. for battery. I think it's a, diff a different problem. Um, so one is, do you have the electric electrical capacity at the time that you need it to run your heat pumps to extract heat out of the ground? Right. But the issue that Louis is talking about, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is when you actually have too high a demand to be able to extract that amount of heat out of the ground oh, I see. at the rate that you need to. And so can you make it up with something else? I would argue, again, this is like, you know, all of this costs, but like the batteries are probably not the way to do that because the challenge is again, not extracting the heat or not, not having the power. It's about extracting the heat. Yeah. That thermal energy storage would be a, a good, less expensive mm -hmm. way to do it. So running your heat pumps to either, whether it's heating water or uh, using ice, believe it or not. And you can, so this is when you have the power, you basically melt a bunch of ice when you, when you have a bunch of heat, uh, waste heat available, or when you have a lot of power on the grid, or maybe just solar's doing stuff. And then you basically make ice when you need to extract heat. And because ice has a, or water has a very large um, uh, uh, latent heat of phase change, you can store a lot of energy in a relatively small area. So I, I think that's that's one area to to look at is thermal storage. That's great. Um, but they're two different kinds of problems, I think. There, there's a company called Ice Energy, if you want to sort of poke around it. Yep. People trying to do ice storage. It's not very popular anymore. Nope. Not not it used to be. There was a huge yep. ice storage facility down at Friendly's in in uh oh, Graham, I guess. Right. They're cold. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was originally it was about uh, peak shaving, right? If you you basically get a, a cheap rate to make some ice during the night and then during the right. day, your facility needs cooling and you just melt the ice and circulate that. Um, I Now we're getting off topic and it's, it's uh, almost five. Uh, does anyone else have anything they want to share? Um, do we want to adjourn? I move we adjourn. I second that. Um, okay. Uh, do I have to say discussion? No. 
Is there no? Okay, so I can just call a roll to a, to a juror. Yeah. Okay, Angie Gregory. Yes. Eric Winkler. Yeah. Carolyn Mish. Yeah. Rich Persley. Yes. Deb Clemmer. Yes. Louis Hasbrook. Yes. Katie Deppin. Yes. Me, yes. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you guys very much. Um, Have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, take care. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.